Since Easter, we've been looking at this relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. Jesus was raised from the dead, but the scriptures talk about how we are united with Jesus, that we died with him, we were also raised with him, and that we live with him. And we've been trying to unpack what that looks like. What does it mean to be raised with Christ? And we described it as a marriage relationship, where you uh, say to this dearly loved person in your life, you say, I do, I commit myself to you, I belong to you, we're going to do life together, we're going to think of each other, we're going to uh, uh, work together, life is going to go on now with two becoming one. And we also saw how it, that also this new relationship with Jesus Christ means that we're like a citizen of a new country that there's that old dictator, sin, Satan, who wants to control our lives and still keep bringing us down and fill us with guilt and, and fear and we're no good and condemnation, all these things. And Jesus says, no, I have set you free from all of that. You now belong to me. You don't need to listen to him anymore. You are living in a new realm. I have made all things new. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. Last week we looked at baptism, and baptism as we baptize here, but to be baptized with Christ, to enter into this relationship with him. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. It's no longer my life. It's about living this life for Jesus Christ. The life I now live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And we looked at the illustration of, of immigrants to this country who have studied hard and worked hard and invested a lot because they want to become citizens of the United States. And finally, when that ceremony comes and they say, I do, they are now citizens of the United States state there's great joy all of the privileges and blessings of of this country are theirs and you could say in a way that they've been baptized into George Washington now what began you know 240 years ago uh, they now enter into the truth of that the reality of that the the blessings of this country the privileges that we have the promises are now part of these immigrants' experience. They share in that because they have become citizens of the new country. And then babies who are born, also born into families who are citizens. Though they are you know, clueless about what's going on, yet they share in the privileges that this country protects them, it surrounds them. There's, they, they speak into this child's life and so in baptism, God speaks and says, you are mine. The privileges and the blessings of being in this covenant community, this co community of promise, are yours. You've been born into the family. You've been welcomed into this royal family. You share in all of the privileges and the blessings of that. Now, that doesn't mean that these children are automatically saved. No, God is calling each of us to respond in faith to our new baptism identity in Jesus. But he speaks the first word of promise, and we respond in faith and love and service. Peter would say, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and all who are far off for all whom the Lord our God will call. And so, in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Okay, that's kind of a recap then of those last two sermons. That leads us into then that we've been clothed with Christ. That's another way of saying that we live with Jesus, living with Jesus. And we're going to take a look at Colossians 3 verses 1 through 4 today. Paul says, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on the things above 
where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. What does it mean to set your hearts on the things above? Paul is saying it has a lot to do with your passions and your desires. What drives your life? What steers your decisions? What, what uh, do you go through? What are you, if you set your goals on? What are you pursuing? Uh, graduation is coming up, right? You know, and there's so many high school and college commencement addresses. And what does every uh, commencement speaker say? If you set your heart on something, why, you can do it, you know. And so if you want to be a track star, you can do it. If you want to be a concert cellist, you can do it. If you want to be an aerospace engineer, put your heart on that. Work hard and you can do it. If you want to be a successful business person, the world is yours. Grab hold of it. I've heard a million graduation speeches. They all say that, right? And so all these graduates are going, wow. What are my passions? What are my desires? What are my dreams? And some are successful. Some are able to accomplish it. But I also know that a lot of graduates are filled with fear. They, they fear failure. They, they wonder about all the debt that they've built up. They, they doubt whether they will be successful. There's all kinds of anxiety going on because they're not sure if they will be able to accomplish all of these things. But rather than asking, what are my passions, my desires, my goals, my dreams, a Christian says, what are Jesus' desires for my life? See the difference? One is living for yourself. And the other one is living for Jesus Christ. Rick Warren wrote that book, The Purpose Driven Life, and he starts out and he says, it's not about you. I mean, that's about as un-American as you can get, right? What do you mean it's not about me? Everything is about me. No, he says, it's not about you. The purpose of your life is for greater than your own personal fulfillment, your own peace of mind, or even your happiness. What? Well, then what, what is it about? You were made by God and for God. And until you understand that, life will never make sense. We were designed for a purpose. We were designed for the Creator to live in relationship with Him, to love and serve Him. And like when you try to use a machine or a tool not for its purpose, things often go wrong. And that's the story of our lives. When we live for ourselves, things go wrong. When we live for Jesus Christ, we are aligned with God's purposes for us. So to ask the question, how can my life reveal Jesus and bring glory to him are the kinds of questions we ask when we are united with Jesus Christ, when we want to live in relationship to him. Paul says, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. And so living your life with Jesus means living your life for Jesus. Set your hearts. Set your hearts on things above. But then Paul goes on. He says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. On the one hand, you could say he's saying the same thing. But if perhaps setting your heart is on your passions and your desires, your goals and your dreams, to set your mind is really on your daily focus. What are my daily choices? What am I going to do this day where I'm setting my mind on the things above? Now, 
Some people think that all that Christians do, you know, once they get saved is they just have their minds in heaven, right? You know, we're going to go to heaven, we're going to pluck harps and sing, and, you know, and at least for uh, middle school boys, it's like, oh boy, this could be so boring in heaven, but that's not the case at all. That, I mean, yes, that's our ultimate destination. That's the ultimate goal. But living your life with Christ is not just, you know, kind of in this cloud, ozone, you know, totally disconnected to the world sort of a thing. No, it's what Jesus prayed. God, may your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is being done in heaven. In other words, how can we take heaven's goals, heaven's dreams, heaven's values, heaven's priorities, and put them in place here on earth? That's our prayer, that's our desire, that's God's desire for all who are followers of Jesus Christ, that we take the beauty and the joy and the, and the truth of heaven and we work it into the fabric of this world so that things are transformed. Now, Paul will go on to talk about what that might look like in terms of our own uh, choices, the, the vices that we need to get rid of. He says, put to death, therefore, what belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. These things, put them to death. They don't belong in your life. You must get rid of uh, from yourselves all such things as these anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. And he probably didn't know about internet, but I'm sure there's a whole range of things that go along there as well. Do not lie to each other, he says. Why? Since you have taken off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator. What does that look like? As God's chosen people, holy, dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bear with each other and forgive one another. And if any of you has a grievance against someone, Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all of these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Love is the characteristic of the Christian life. Love God and love others. And so not only working on the interior life, all of the garbage that needs to be gotten rid of and all of the good things that God wants to plant inside of us, that needs then to find expression on how we look around the world and how we see society and the things that are going on. In our own community, there's a discussion going on saying, what do we do with the people who have decided to settle along the mill race area in, in their little homeless camps? It's becoming more and more of a problem, more and more of a nuisance, more and more, uh, you know, uh, uh, different things are happening there. But yet these are people. People who, for whatever reason, have just kind of disconnected from life. Whether they're just, you know, circumstances, mental illness, addictions, there's a whole host of things going on here. And I appreciate in our community that the leaders are asking good questions and, and trying to surround themselves with people who understand these issues better and say, what would be a compassionate response? What's going to be a long-term healthy response? What's a loving response to the issue of homelessness? Not just kick them out and send them on the run, down the road, but how do we treat them as image bearers of God, people with dignity? It flows out of love. Set your mind, set your hearts on things above. We support a school here and, and going in. And, and so we as Christians are saying, how can we make an impact on these institutions in our community? How can we go along and support kids who are at risk, whose homes are chaotic, and provide stable mentors uh, through the Kids Hope Program? How can we help children who want to, who have leadership potential to succeed? Well, we'll support Student Leadership Summit. There are so many ways that we are expressing the love of Jesus Christ in 
interacting with our school because our hearts and our minds are set on the things above, not just on the earthly things. A week ago, we helped out with Help a House. There, there you guys are. Yeah, and we gave a Saturday morning and some of the afternoon to paint a house because somebody needed a little extra help. They didn't have the resources to do the complete job themselves, but here we were, we had a great time. In fact, some of you had a little too much fun with that paint, but you know, we won't get into that. We had a great time serving. And when the day was done, a whole house and a garage were completed and the homeowner was moved. She said, wow, people in this community love and they care. We demonstrated the love and care of Jesus Christ last fall, putting together the hygiene kits through our denomination. We speak into complex issues like the environment in which things are so polarized, people don't even listen to each other anymore, but try to steer through that and say, how can we be good stewards and caretakers of God's creation? It all belongs to him. We're caretakers here. How can we do a better job with that? to speak into the debate that continues to rage on over the origins of life and whether this uh, baby in the womb is human or not and the mother's choice but protecting life. How can we speak the values of the kingdom into these debates and so give witness to the love and grace of our Heavenly Father, joining together, hand in hand, working uh, together, even with people with whom we may not always see eye to eye, but finding common ground and being able to infuse these conversations with kingdom values, values which people in their hearts say, you know, that's right, that's what's good. Let's continue to focus on that. For business leaders to say, how can my business be more about than just making money? Sure, that's what a business does. It makes money, but it does so much more than that. It provides employment in the community. It impacts the environment. How can I do business in an ethical way with integrity and, and understanding all the dynamics and the impact of that? How can I, as a scientist, do good research Research that's helpful, research that benefits mankind, not research that, that's tainted or twisted because uh, somebody is infusing a lot of money in that and paying my salary, but we're per in the pursuit of truth. And so in all of these ways, we look to serve. We just heard from Randy and Morgan. <laughs> I can get your picture up there too. And here they are, you know, nurse, school teacher, but God is calling them to do something different, not with what they're doing right now is wrong or bad, no, it's awesome, it's great, but God is saying, you know what, for you and your family, we've got something so much different for you to be a support for missionaries who are serving in Africa and all in, through that region. And they say, yes, Lord, we'll go, we will follow. Abraham Kuyper, a Reformed theologian, said there is not one square inch of the entire creation about which Jesus does not cry out, this is mine. We are to have impact wherever we are, wherever God sends us, bringing the values of the kingdom of God to bear upon life here in this world. Now, you may be going, whoa, that's exhausting. Is it all up to me? Do, you know, I, I can barely just survive during the day. How in the world do I do all this? It's not you, folks. Remember, it's not about you. It's about Jesus Christ and Jesus living in you, living with Jesus. Paul completes our passage and he says, you died. Your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And so, before we get a whole, you know, big idea of like, well, I'm going to save the world, I'm going to go out and accomplish all of these things, we need to start out with the right connection, setting our souls 
there's a decision that has to be made. Am I trusting in Jesus Christ for my salvation? That's foundational. That's critical, of utmost important. That you don't just start out with saying, I've got all these noble ideals I'm trying to pursue. But no, I am connected and belong to Jesus, my Savior. Have you asked him into your life? Have you received his gift of forgiveness? Have you told him how broken you are? He knows already. And say, Lord, please forgive me. Make me whole. Make me new. And then from there, having made that foundational decision, then you declare that your life is dead to sin, dead to the old ways, dead to self-serving, and yes to God serving. You say, I'm not my own, but I belong to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. What he speaks into my life, I want to listen, I want to do. And so then it's a determination to live with and for Jesus. You died. Your life is now hidden with Christ and God. But now Jesus is, is holding your life and what you do, whether it's seen on a grand level or whether it's just quietly serving, praying faithfully, helping out in ways that don't get big publicity or anything like that, but yet it's the kingdom, the kingdom of God moving forward in, in very small but yet powerful ways touching hearts and lives, changing attitudes and views, helping people to be loving and caring and moving forward. It's a determination to live each day for Jesus Christ and then finally knowing there's a day that's coming where every eye will see and every ear will hear. Jesus Christ will come again in glory and all the world will know it at that stage. Everyone will understand, wow, he really is the Son of God. He really is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And for some it will be, oh, I didn't realize, I didn't understand, I didn't want to pay attention. I was too busy living life for myself. And for others it will be hallelujah. What we are doing here and now has contributed towards God's great work of establishing his kingdom here on earth and bringing Christ back again to set all things right and to make all things new. And so in your day-to-day -day lives, as you wake up in the morning and say, good morning, Jesus, here we go again. What you got for me today? I may be a student in the middle school, but Lord, I'm here for you. I may be a worker on the assembly line, but Lord, I'm here for you. I'm a mom with three kids and trying to juggle schedules and everything else, and I'm going crazy, but yet, Lord, I'm doing it for you. I'm a teacher. I'm a doctor. I'm whatever it is that you are. God has placed you there to live for him, to work in concert with Jesus Christ. And so it's not about whatever you set your heart on, you can accomplish, but whatever God has planted inside of you, he will accomplish because he is making all things new. Do you long for that day? when Jesus will come again. Those whose hearts beat strong for the return of Christ also work hard to speed its coming. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, you began something so amazing 
so earth-shattering, history-altering, life-transforming when you died and rose again. And Lord, I don't want this day to go by without everyone having a chance to say yes to you. Yes, Jesus, come into my life. Yes, forgive my sins. Yes, I need your salvation, your grace. But then from there to say yes every day, living in relationship that we've been raised with you, baptized in you, and now serve you with all of our hearts. Empower us, Lord, by your spirit. And give us a hunger, a thirst, a passion for your kingdom. Lord, we want to see your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In your name we pray, amen.